We're going to be in the book of Proverbs. You can go ahead and turn to Proverbs chapter 1. So, one of the things that... Um, that happens between Pastor Philip and I when we're discussing where to go next in any kind of teaching series as we look at things like the calendar, the schedule, the, the, as we pray over different matters of where, where, what's the season for the congregation. One of the things that often happens is we, we have books that we would really like to get into. Um, and we talk about, and I, I would love to teach through this section of scripture. I would love to teach this book. Um, one of the ways that we arrived at Pastor Philip teaching through the book of Jude was considering all those different things. There was a book that we both really wanted to teach through. Um, and then as we considered the schedule of him being gone for this period of time and, and beginning the book of Ecclesiastes, which Lord willing, uh, this fall we're going to be getting into, we started to look at what are some places that we would like to bring the church? Where are some places that would be beneficial for us all to, to look at together? And then as we started to look at even the Wednesday night schedule to say, all right, what, what's an area that would be beneficial in particular through the closing days of summer, getting into the school year, but where should we go that would be beneficial for really everyone that we have in here? As we walk through this portion of the year, we also have the student ministry. Normally, not tonight, they're at camp, but normally they would be gathered in with us. And so one of the things that we have a desire to teach through, that's not what this is going to be, but we have a desire to teach through at some point is the book of Proverbs. And so this is going to be a, a quick run at the book of Proverbs. What we're going to consider beginning this evening, what does it look like to live a life of wisdom according to God's word? And one of the things that I think is, is so wonderful about this is when you come to a book like Proverbs, there's not really an opt-out category. There's not really a place at which you can say, here's my off-ramp. This doesn't apply to me. Because when we consider the book of Proverbs, I think everybody in here would say, yeah, I, I, I recognize I, I need wisdom. And if anyone in here would say, I, I don't need wisdom, you most certainly would be fitting another category in the book of Proverbs. And, and, and would say, you know, you're a prime candidate for wisdom. So what that means is there's no season of life where this is not applicable. There's no sort of situation or circumstance in which you're going to walk where you would say, I really just don't need guidance. I don't need advice. I don't need discretion. I don't need discernment. Rather, we would look at this and we would say, according to God's good design, one of the blessings we have is, as one author put it, the only authorized handbook for wisdom in life. And that's what the book of Proverbs is. Now, a couple little disclaimers before we get into what we're going to be considering. And that is one of them is sometimes the book of Proverbs is difficult to approach. It's difficult to approach for what might be some surprising reasons. One, we, we can approach, and this would be an incorrect approach, we can approach Proverbs as if, well, these are just like good maxims to live by, you know, some nice uh, sayings that I can apply to different situations, kind of like a collection from Ben Franklin. That would be a very wrong way of looking at the book of Proverbs. As if, well, you know, these are just nice sayings. They don't really have anything to do, and this would be where it gets especially dangerous. This doesn't really have anything to do with my walk with the Lord. In fact, what we're going to consider foundationally this evening is that wisdom is above all else about our relationship to the Lord. Wisdom is not just an intellectual thing. Wisdom is primarily, foundationally, at, at, at the most base level, wisdom is a moral thing. Wisdom is a moral thing. That means to be unwise is, is very quickly going to turn into sin. To be unwise is to be heading toward, if not diving face first, into sin. What that means is that if we have a book that's saying, read this for wisdom, we need to read it. It can be difficult to approach because we can be dismissive towards it. Another way that Proverbs can be difficult to approach is because it's, I mean, it's scattered. Certain 
chapters and even whole sections of chapters in the book of Proverbs can be difficult to approach where we're going, all right, what, what do I do with this? How, how do I apply this to my life? Do I just remember it and, and hope it comes in handy? For many of them, actually, yes. For, for many of them, though, it is a, all right, how do I, how do I handle this? It seems like these are all not really all related one to another. It just seems like a random listing of, well, this topic and then this topic and then this topic. That would be a wrong approach to the book of Proverbs because Proverbs has a purpose statement. We're going to consider it in just a moment right here in the first few verses. But the third way that we can approach this book wrongly, a third wrong approach to it, is to say, yeah, hey, this wisdom is good and I want to apply it. And, you know, it's just, it's good for everybody. It's good for everybody and it, it really doesn't matter what this has to do with whether I'm a believer or not. It's very similar to that first category. This doesn't really have anything to do with my relationship with the Lord. This third approach basically says, there's good advice, I need good advice, let me approach Proverbs for good advice. The trouble is, when we approach it that way, we divorce it from, we, 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 we strip away, no, 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 there is a difference, a big difference, between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. So often, there can be this attitude towards things in Proverbs where it's like, hey, you know, it's just good sound advice in there. Anybody could read this and benefit from it. Yes, but not in the same way that a believer can read this and benefit from it. Why? Well, because they're missing the most important part. That this has a specific relationship. This has a specific relationship not just to God in general, but the Lord Christ himself who is the perfection of the wisdom of God. Now we'll get into that in just a minute, but for right now I want us to go ahead and look at the first several verses of Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel, to understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. And then, just, just with that, we have the introduction. This is where we're going, so that you can know so that you can discern, so you can receive instruction. We're going to break these up in just a moment. But understand, he's just said, here's why Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, has written these things. And specifically, the first nine chapters are going to take a very particular shape. But right out the gate, he's laying out, here's why these things are written. But before we go any farther, we need to have this as a foundation. Verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now listen, what that just did was that introduced massive dynamics into this entire understanding of wisdom. That introduced some massive dynamics. Let me, let me show you what some of them are. First of all, the fear of the Lord. And, and you'll notice in your translation, most of you, if not all of you, that's going to be that uppercase in the smaller letters of capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Lord, that covenantal name of God, Yahweh, that, that relational name that he has with Israel. In other words, this is signaling right out the gate. This is not just a fear of God in general. This isn't only a fear of God. We're going to talk much more extensively about the fear of the Lord in just a minute. But this is not just a fear of just, you know, God that's non-specific. 
This is the fear of God that's born out of their relationship to Him. This is a fear of God that's born out of a relationship to Him. Now, under the Old Covenant, under the Old Testament, that relationship took on a very specific framework, which is why some of the Proverbs are framed the way that they are. Some of that relationship that Israel experienced with Yahweh in the Old Testament was, if you do this, here's what you can expect. Specifically, as it pertains to things like, if you disobey, you, you may not have a good harvest. If you disobey and continue and persist in your disobedience, you're not going to have your land. You're going to be driven out of it as a discipline for forsaking the covenant with me. Which, by the way, that understanding, which we have to approach Proverbs with, it's in the Old Testament. So that means that it's taking place under Old Testament framework. When we come to some of the Proverbs that are going to deal with, hey, if you do this, you can expect full barns. Okay, what does that mean for us in the New Testament? Not exactly the same thing that it did Israel. One of the things that you'll find as you go into some of the, the, and I would not recommend going into it, but maybe you've brushed up against it, the foolishness of things like the prosperity gospel, the health and wealth sort of teaching. So often there's this, let's dive into Proverbs and see, look, this is God's word and this is what it says. Let's understand it in its context. Let's understand it as it relates to God and His specific promises to His people at a, specific, at a specific time. It's not dealing with salvation. Those things are dealing with your welfare in the land. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. Which means we can't get to a right kind of wisdom a godly wisdom without knowing this God. We cannot have godly wisdom without knowing this God. In other words, all of the, and this is something that's echoed throughout the New Testament, in particular, we don't, I don't know if we're going to have time to go there this evening, but, but I would encourage you, look at 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2. They're going to deal with the vast difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. One of the things that we're going to find is you can have people who are intelligent and, and well informed according to the way in which God has caused the world to function, but they're actually fools because they don't acknowledge God, like Romans 1 would talk about. And it's maddening for those that know God. I've used this example with some of my students before, but one time I was watching a video uh, with, with Abby about uh, hammerhead sharks. Cool. Right? Just learn about hammerhead sharks and marvel at your creator. But as we're watching this video about hammerhead sharks and about how they have been designed, wait for it, by nature... How did nature design it? To do this thing and look at how. And they, they started charting the evolutionary progress of the hammerhead shark. Which they have no evidence of or anything. Just, you know, that's probably what happened. And as I began to chart this and show this, I paused the video and I said, Abby, did you hear what they said? Nature designed this. And even, this is a couple years ago, eight years old, even as an eight-year-old, she's sitting there going, makes no sense at all. Kept watching the video and it kept talking about how life had engineered. How amazing is life to engineer this, right? Well, here's the thing. There was all sorts of technical wisdom to be able to explain, here's how the function of this animal has been designed. But there's all of the foolishness of they don't know the designer. They don't know the creator. And as a result, they cannot penetrate to real wisdom. Beloved, the smartest person you know, if they don't know the Lord, biblically, they don't have wisdom. They might be incredible in their specific field, but... 
they're always going to hit a ceiling. They're always going to hit a wall of what actual wisdom means. True, full, godly wisdom. Why? Well, because they don't know the Creator. And what that leads to, Romans 1 tells us, is a darkening of the understanding. But is that where that ends? According to Romans 1, is it just their understanding is darkened? What happens next? What happens in the digression of Romans chapter 1? Anybody, anybody remember? This is the interactive portion. What, what happens next? Does it stay in the understanding? Yeah, God gives them over what? The desires of their heart? There starts to be this giving over into moral realms. You track this digression in Romans chapter 1. Those who refuse to acknowledge God as God, not only is, is their foolish heart darkened, and they don't have clear understanding, they become morally insane. Sometimes we can look around at our society and say, I just don't understand, this is illogical. The things that are happening. This is a complete denial of basic truth. How did this happen? Well, they didn't acknowledge God as God. And so they exchanged the creature for the Creator. They worship the creature rather than the creator, which means that, man, what, you know what our society really needs? It's not better education. It's spiritual insight. It's the illumination that comes by the Spirit of God to the Word of God about the character and person of God. Which, which let's be clear, that's to be the business that we're about. We're about proclaiming the wisdom of God, which is foolish to this world. This is all in reference to 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, where Paul says, there's, there's the wise of this age, and the wise of this age, the wisdom of this world, it's foolishness in the eyes of God. So what has God done? He's chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. In other words, he's taken the foolish, the base, the despised of this world. And he said, no, 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 that's the wisdom of God. I, I was reading a book on church history this morning. One of the things that it, the author referenced right out the gate was Christianity, unique among all the religions of the world, Christianity is the only faith in which the entire centerpiece of their worship, the high watermark of Christianity is the humiliation of our God. This is a central point of history. So when Christ became obedient unto death, even death on a cross... Which, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, yeah, that's, that's foolishness to the world. That's foolishness to the world. But to those who are being saved, do we know what it says? Christ has become wisdom and righteousness. In other words, one of the implications of that is that we're never going to rationalize somebody into the kingdom of God. We're never going to be like, hey, I, let me show you through mere intellectual haranguing the wisdom of God. What's it going to take? Well, Scripture gives us the answer. The foolishness of preaching. And by the way, Apart from that, there's not salvation. It's going to take the proclamation of specifically the person and work of Christ to bring about salvation, Romans 10 tells us. How are they going to be saved unless they 
believe in? How are they going to believe unless they hear? And how are, how are they going to hear unless somebody preaches? And how is somebody going to do that unless they're sent? Which, by the way, that's some of the work that we get to participate in. Beloved, one of the wonders, and Lord willing, through the coming weeks, we're going we're to examine some of this. One of the wonders is that as believers, we're granted insight into all the mysteries. We have the greatest key to understand. What, what is everything about? The great intellectual pursuit of every age. Who am I? Why am I here? Where did I come from? Believers are saying, that's the easy stuff. That's the stuff that if you go down the hall and you ask all of those kids in that classroom with Miss Barb right now, they're all going to say, well, that's, that's the basics. And what happens? The wise, according to this age, who have forsaken the wisdom of God, say, no, 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 it can't be that simple. So instead, what do we who have believed? What do we do? How do we respond? Because here's the thing. It should not be with pride because where do we get this wisdom? From him. Not because we were so... No, no, no. Remember, he chose the base things of this world to glorify himself. He chose the foolish things. To which Paul, again, 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 says... There's not many wise, not many mighty. In other words, we can't look at ourselves and say, I was smart enough to believe. I figured it out. We can't even point to someone else and say, you know, they just, they convinced me. And we can say, look, that person was instrumental in my coming to faith. That person shared the gospel with me, answered all of my questions, clarified all the things that I had not understood. But at the end of the day, we have to confess, the Lord overcame my darkness with his light. That through the preaching of the cross, I was given insight into this mystery that had been hidden for ages, but has now been revealed. The Christ is the Savior of all those who call upon him. So what do we do? We, we remain humble in that and we grow in wisdom. We pursue, well, God has made these things known. I need to know him. I need to know him. That knowledge of him produces a fear of him. That knowledge of him produces a fear of him. Verse 7 of Proverbs chapter 1 where we've kind of been peeling back layers here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Which, by the way, a couple things happening here. Number one, this takes this back to, there, there's a moral issue here. Those who are morally fools are those who have rejected a fear of the Lord. Those who don't fear the Lord are moral fools. In other words, through their rejection of the Lord, they're going to, rejection of his authority, his lordship, his, his role as sovereign of the universe, their rejection of him is going to result in their disobedience to his law. That's why it's going to say several times in the Psalms, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. Why? What's actually taking place there? Is that just decrying atheism? Actually, one of the first things that's decrying is accountability. I don't have to answer to anybody. Despite what the conscience has told me, despite what everything and the morality that has been granted to me, the sense of right and wrong and justice, I'm not accountable to anybody, but I expect others to be held accountable. That person, according to the verdict of God, is a fool. Because they're saying, I, I'm not accountable to anybody. I can do what I want. If you keep reading, that's in Psalm 14.1. If you keep reading through that psalm, one of the things that it says is, they start becoming corrupt in their deeds. 
that rejection of the authority and the accountability to God is a corruption of ways. So what do we need? Well, verse 7, that second clause there, it gives us the insight. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So if we're not going to be a fool, what do we need? We need wisdom. How are we going to get wisdom? Via instruction. So if we're going to be those who live according to what Proverbs is declaring and, and, and providing, and even I, I would dare say through what this chapter, what chapter 8 is going to demonstrate for us, is actually crying out for, if we're going to take heed to this, it means that we have to be learners. We have to be those who are receiving instruction from God's word as the authoritative source of, well, this is, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of this. Where can I learn about him? From the revelation of himself. From his word. That's what we need most. So as we get going into Proverbs, understand this is not just about Proverbs. If we want wisdom, what we must have first, foundationally, primarily, before anything else, we must have Christ. But if we have Christ, we don't just need Proverbs, we need all of Scripture to see God as He's revealed Himself. And that God in His grace and kindness towards those who fear Him has given a particular book in His self-revelation that says, and here's how you navigate life. Here's how you navigate the circumstances of life. What a wonderful God that we have. You know, one of the things that is, I've, I've delved into the study of this, one of the things that I've, I've found is that for years, sort of categorically, people didn't know what to do with the li wisdom literature. The, the scholars and, uh, you know, Bible commentators and things like that, they really just didn't know, like, where do we put this? Because it doesn't, like, progress the, the, the history of Israel. It, it doesn't necessarily, from you know, a large perspective, it doesn't really reveal like what should we expect in the Messiah. It doesn't talk about how to, how to you know, the look at redemption accomplished and applied to Christ. It doesn't really provide any of that. It just seems like it's telling me instruction of how to live in God's world. Man, how disappointing, right? But understand, God is concerned with how we live. God is concerned with how are you navigating day to day life? How are you walking through his world? And that's what Proverbs in particular is going to give us a framework for. It's going to give us that instruction to say, and here's how you navigate life. In fact, some commentators, as they've approached the book of Proverbs, one of the things that they've said in regard to sort of the seemingly haphazard arrangement of a lot of it, they've said it just reflects the messiness of life. It just reflects that some days you're going to need this, and five minutes later you're going to need that. I think, that, I think there's some legitimacy to that interpretation. That sometimes as you're walking through a proverb, you're going to see just a scattering of, of, of subjects and it's reflecting some days. You hit all these. It's a recognition of we have a God who knows us. We have a God who has, in his incarnation, he has perfected wisdom. He has accomplished perfect wisdom. I want you to think about that for just a second. Christ in his time on earth, from Bethlehem to Calvary, was never once unwise. How about that? I think sometimes we pick up on that in the conversations, the interactions. Think about, especially the, the scenes with the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the temple, the final week of Christ's life. He's in Jerusalem. They're seeking to trap him with his words. 
And some of them who are coming incognito, they're coming undercover. They've been sent by the Pharisees. They've been sent by the ruling leaders. Good teacher, we know that you're doing all these wonderful things. But Jesus, perceiving, discerning what's going on in them, knowing what's happening either didn't answer them. Man, I wonder if there's a proverb about that, not answering a fool according to their folly. Or, in another instance, sees what's happening as they're trying to trap him. Good teacher, should we, should we pay our taxes to Caesar? Who's got a coin? And what are they astonished with? They're astonished with his wisdom. Nobody spoke like this one. What did he do? Well, he answered them. In the same way that he was trying to be trapped by them, he turned that right around and absolutely flummoxed them. With, no one ever spoke like this man. He's the perfection of wisdom. Now, what are we as dear children called to be? Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 would tell us we're to be imitators of Christ. As beloved children. If we're going to walk in a Christ-like way, what, what, is, what does that mean? It behooves us to walk wisely. So we have this gracious gift from our Lord of, here's how we can know wisdom and instruction, discern the sayings of understanding, receive instruction-wise behavior, so we can, as the naive, gain prudence, have knowledge and discretion, understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. This is what's provided for us by the book of Proverbs. Now, a couple things I want to get into this evening as we are wading a little bit more into this. So far, I haven't given you really headings with this. The idea of what we've walked through is what is wisdom? Where do we get it? What's it good for? Really, that's I want to I want to camp for just a second longer on this idea of what is wisdom. When we come to the book of Proverbs, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to be borrowing very liberally from. Uh, a wonderful book, and I'd recommend it. It's one of the best, just how to get your hands on the book of Proverbs. It's called Practicing Proverbs by a man by the name of Richard Mayhew. I'm we'll going to be borrowing heavily from that this evening as we walk through this. Just Sometimes you come to somebody's work and you say, this is so good, I'm going to tell everyone it was theirs, and then I'm going to teach it. So here, one of the things that is laid out for us is that the most common language that's used in regard to wisdom in the book of Proverbs. Three terms in particular, or three ways in which wisdom is, is laid out for us in the book of Proverbs. And one of the first one, one of the first meanings of it is, is wisdom in terms of skill. It's actually translated sometimes or, or brought to us in the understanding of uh, they were given a heart of wisdom in their particular craftsmanship. For instance, in Exodus 35, when it talks about the, the craftsmen, or in 1 Kings, when it talks about the craftsmen who are going to be working in the tabernacle or the temple, they had been given wisdom, a particular skill in their craftsmanship of how to work with a particular metal or, or a particular um, kind of artisanship. In that practice, they had a wisdom. Uh, another idea of this, and this is something that we see even in these opening verses of Proverbs, all three of these meanings are at play. The next one is this idea of wisdom being the one who's intellectually skillful. In other words, they're astute. They, they pick up on things. And in particular, they pick up on things in observation of how the world works. As you walk through the book of Proverbs, one of the things that will come out is this idea of there's a lot of a, I saw this, for instance, we're, we're familiar with the section of Proverbs that deals with, I walked by the field of the slothful, and I saw the way that it was overgrown, and I looked, and I took heed, and I gained insight. 
what, what's taking place. There's an observational wisdom that's being gained. But, but you have this also from other things. These figures and riddles and words of the wise that are described here in Proverbs 1 through 6. This idea of someone who's seeing something, gaining insight into how the world works. How is it that we can have somebody who has not been given the wisdom of God who can explain to us this is how a hammerhead shark hunts? Well, because they have been allowed through the common grace of God to understand this is how the world operates. And this is one of the really wonderful things that we ought, to, we ought to just chew on for a second. One of the really wonderful things we ought to chew on is the fact that in the grace of the Lord, unbelievers are able to perceive things about the way that God has ordered His world. And that is used primarily though not exclusively, for the benefit of other people. Which, by the way, this is one of the aspects of godliness that the unbelievers don't get to participate in. As they are able to see and understand, like, I, I watched this thing, I studied this, and I recognized this is how this works. One of the things that takes place in this is that they don't have an ability to participate in giving God the glory for what they've observed. They don't have the ability, as they see, like the video I talked about earlier, how life engineered this. They don't get to participate in giving God glory for that. And please don't miss out on this. Biblically, it's a blessing. It's a joy. It is good to sing praises to our God. So for those who observe things, study things, gain insight into the world that God created and don't give Him glory for those things, they're missing out. They are missing out. Why? They're unable to participate in everything that God intended that. Because you understand, God has created all things for His glory. Is there any wonder that they're sort of like, I just don't know, why is this here? Why did this happen? When you think about it, sometimes that sounds like the childish questions of a five-year-old, right? Why? Why is it that way? Why? Why did they do that? I, we have a little bit of a policy in our home that as often as we can, we want to answer those questions. Sometimes we get to the bottom of the, the why, right? Why, why did it do that? That's how God made it to do. Why did he make it to do it that way? Well, because this is what it's producing. Why, why did he make it to produce that? For his glory, son. Let's, let's go. But understand, that is at the end of that string. Now, we might get there a little sooner some days. It's just for his glory. Let's go. We might get there sooner some days, but understand that is at the end of that string. And for the person who can't find the end of the string, how frustrating is that? Is there searching, studying, trying to penetrate into all the mysteries of the world that God has created? They can't get to the end. They can't get to, I just don't understand why, the, you know, why is it like this? Why is this here? Well, it's so that we wonder it the incredible power and might and wisdom of our God. This second use of wisdom, this idea of God has actually created the world a particular way, it's a wonderful gift. And by the way, that means then, not only are those who don't know him not able to participate fully in all of their exploration of it, that also has an indictment towards us as believers, as the ones who know what's at the end of the string, the glory of God, believers should be some of the most curious about God's world. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to camp here for just a second. One of the things my students hear a lot, there's no such thing as boring. Nothing is boring if you're paying attention. 
Nothing is boring if you're paying attention. I, I believe that. Why? Because it's all there for something. Now we might get to the end of that stream pretty quick. This is for God's glory. But all the stops along that path He has put there so that we would grow in marveling at Him. Think of how often creation is referenced as testifying to the glory of God. What, what does God's word say about it? All of it. All of it is proclaiming the glory of God, which means that the more we look at it, the more we understand of it, the grander we are able to understand Him to be. Now, we have to be careful because it is an incomplete revelation. We can't say, well, then I'm going to close my Bible and go on a hike and get the same thing out of it. Wrong. I'm just going to go contemplate the mountains for a minute and that will be the same as reading a psalm, right? Wrong. Why? This is beautiful because we need the wisdom of God in order to understand what exactly that mountain's there for. That means that we read God's word in order to understand and appreciate and worship him for God's world. He has through his creation, through the works of his hands, made himself known, displayed his glory, put it out there across the universe in the macro and in the micro, that the deeper you go, the closer you look, the more complex everything gets. You put something under a microscope, it doesn't get less interesting. The farther down you go, the more you're going, this is incredible. One of the ways that we can see this, just in, just in a minute way. Every now and then you, you, you might see these headlines flash up and if you're, if you're not like me, you probably keep going. I see this and I'm like, this is, this is it. This is going to be a good read. Researchers of the polar ice caps drilling down hundreds of feet and discovering a brand new type of creature that lives and has been designed to live in that particularly harsh, difficult environment in underwater rivers that flow somehow underneath the ice under hundreds of feet and no one, get this, within the thousands of years that we've been here since creation, nobody's known about them. And some, research, some researcher stumbles across them as they drop a camera down that hole and see it and go, look, I'm alive down here. What's it there for? So he would go, what an amazing God. All the time, it's, it's one of the great tragedies, all the time as people look to space and look to the just vast reaches of the wonder that God has created in the heavens. With an ability to do so that was unthinkable 300 years ago. Peering into the depths of space, looking at that and going, wow, maybe there's something intelligent out there. When for thousands of years that's been there, waiting to testify to the greatness of God's power when he hung it there. But apart from wisdom, we, we don't know what to do with it. God has designed his world in order, not in chaos. God has designed his world in order to testify to his greatness and his glory. Amen. Those who don't know him can't. They can't worship him for it. So those who do know him ought to. Ought to look and say, man, that's, that's incredible. That thing that God has done through that, I'm in awe of him because of it. Now let me see his wisdom on display that it has continued. Remembering what things like he has said in his word like, all of it is held together by the word of his power. In other words, as we look 
at that created world. The order that's in it. The wonder that's in it. His word is testifying and here's how we live in light of it. A third way. The wisdom is used often in the book of Proverbs. Is how do we navigate in a common sense way all of the hazards of life? How do we navigate just the tricky situations of life? How, how do I know what to do in this particular scenario? Well, because God has ordered all things, and because God is the one who has designed all things for his glory, and because he has called a people for himself to know him and exercise his wisdom, there is a right way and a wrong way to navigate those tricky situations. And in his grace and his goodness, he instructs us, here's how you can handle that situation. What do I do in this circumstance? Exercise wisdom. Sometimes, and some of you have been on the receiving end of this, I know I have. You'll ask the question, what do I do here? What do I do in this situation? How, how do I handle this? What if this thing happens? And you've probably gotten this answer more than once. Yeah, use wisdom. That can be really frustrating, right? Ah, but like, what do I do? Use wisdom. Okay, what does that mean? Take heed to how God has ordered his world. Not just in the complexity of it. In the moral structuring of it. What's right in this situation? What's right in this given instance? I don't know. But if you know him, oh, if you know him, you have insight. How do I navigate that particular situation? What's godly? What's right? What's promoting truth? What's promoting righteousness? What's promoting the glory of God in this particular situation? We can navigate life's difficulties and all of its unique circumstances by taking heed to him. Taking heed to his way. Because he has ordered the world and he has established not just, hey, this is how the laws that govern the continual upholding of my creation function. He's also established, and here is right, and here is wrong, here is righteous, here is unrighteous. And he's revealed both. He's revealed, here's my way, walk in it. One of the things, Lord willing, that we're going to look in as we walk through the book of Proverbs on Wednesday evenings together, one of the things we're going to walk, uh, walk through is the fact that there's two ways presented. So often through the book of Proverbs, you're going to see, don't walk that way. Hey, if you walk after that individual, the end of that path is death. Hey, blessed are those who walk in this way. That means that in all of those tricky circumstances, we're faced with two paths. We're faced with, well, I can go that way, but the end thereof is death. Mm, no, no, no thank you. Or, I can walk that way. This is something we see throughout God's word, isn't it? You can walk in righteousness or you can walk in unrighteousness. You walk according to the flesh, and fleshly wisdom, or you can walk according to the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In other words, what we need is to gain the insight of godly wisdom. And where that begins, we've already seen. Where that begins is, verse 7, a fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. This is going to be amplified, repeated throughout the book of Proverbs. There's going to be this reminder, these continual revisitings of 18 times that phrase is used. 18 times through the book of Proverbs, there's a fear of the Lord. Those who fear the Lord do this. 
This is the kind of person that you need to follow. You need to be associated with the one who fears the Lord. The one who does this thing, they have no fear of the Lord. There's this continual refrain that you want wisdom, you need the fear of the Lord. Again, borrowing from this book, Practicing Proverbs, the author gives a number of what does the fear of the Lord look like? And draws references from across the Word of God because this idea of fearing the Lord, it's a whole Bible concept. It's not something that's limited to the book of Proverbs. Instead, it's the idea that's etched across all of Scripture. It, it's even, I, I was reading it this morning in Jeremiah, it's, it's everywhere. You didn't fear the Lord or tremble at His presence, and therefore... You're walking in unrighteousness. You're doing these things foolishly. You're not following after the Lord. And you've corrupted your way. You're going to experience the consequence of these things. What would have turned all of that differently? Fear of the Lord. What's going to keep us from sin? Right. Taking heed to the Word. Who takes heed to the Word? The ones who fear the Lord. Richard Mayhew offers these. What does fear of the Lord look like? Well, first of all, he says it's joyously delighting in God's Word. Joyously delighting in God's Word. He references Psalm 112, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in His commandment. Beloved, do we delight in God's Word? Or do we view it as a burdensome obligation? I want, I, want to, I want to throw a couple other texts of Scripture at that, at that sentiment. In the Old Testament, those who were walking through a sort of ritualistic observance of the ways of God were condemned by the Lord for in their heart saying, My, how burdensome it is. That we have to, you know, keep the Sabbath. That I have to obey the things that God has said. First John tells us what? His commands are not burdensome. There's two ways to look at this. There's a godly way. There's an ungodly way. Do you view God's word as a delight? Or do you view it as, oh, I guess I have to do this. Or, or it's sin. No, beloved. Delight in what he's revealed of himself. Now, I want to I add a little quick caveat before we move on to the next one. That's not to say that sometimes you're not going to have to wrestle your flesh to the floor and tell it to be quiet. There's going to be moments when your flesh is just going, I don't, don't want to though. Curb stop it move on. And choose to delight in the Lord. Choose to delight in His Word. Well, but it's good. It's sweet. And we don't have to, if we're in Christ, we don't have to yield to the call of our flesh. We're free from that. We're under no obligation. Secondly, this author says, one who fears the Lord consistently walks in God's way. Quoting from Psalm 128, verse 1. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. And then in a parallelism to say, this is what that looks like. Who walks in his ways. In other words, they've delighted in finding out what those ways are. And they're delighting now to be doing them. Sometimes we can't have this casual approach to the ways of the Lord where we say, uh, you know, I, just, I don't know what God wants me to do. I don't know what's, I don't know what's, Right, wise, righteous, unrighteous. I, I just don't know. So I'm, gonna, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to choose the one that I, I kind of want to do anyway. And, and hopefully that's right. Hopefully God's okay with that. <laughs> no. No, 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 no. We delight in learning God's word, which shows us God's ways, and then we delight in walking in them. I, I remember one of the things that, I believe it was in The Holiness of God by R.C. Sproul, but I remember R.C. Sproul wrote this. You've never been satisfied with your sin. 
Whenever you said yes to temptation, indulged in whatever sin was, hand, uh, was dangling out in front of you, you've never been satisfied with it. If you're in Christ, as a believer, even as an unbeliever, it doesn't actually satisfy. You've never been like, yeah, glad I did that. No. But beloved, when was the last time you obeyed the Lord and said, oh, I really wish I hadn't walked in righteousness? No. Not as a believer. No, no genuine believer has ever said, I just really regret walking after righteousness. That's, that's such a foreign concept. You, there's, there's no category for that. One who fears the Lord loves to walk after him. We'll get here eventually, but Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13 confirms this for us. The end of the matter, when all has been heard, fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. One who fears the Lord, the author continues, boldly declares God's works. He quotes from Psalm 64 verse 9. Then all mankind fears. They tell what God has brought about and ponder what he has done. Beloved, it's a delight to look at what God has done. What he's done in his creative works, what he's done through the work of redemption, it's incredible to observe what God has done in your own personal history of God's providential care for you. It's an incredible joy to rehearse those things. To proclaim that to others. This is is what the Lord is doing in my life right now. This is what the Lord has done in preserving me and bringing me to repentance in this area. Growing me in this thing. This is how the Lord is working in my life. And what do the godly do? When they hear that, they praise the Lord. Even as we look at God's word and see, this is what he's promised he's going to do. And there's a proclaiming of that. There's this, I, I want to testify to, here's what God has said He will do. What He's going to accomplish. By the way, He's never yet failed in any of His word. There's a, I, I fear Him, I trust Him, I love Him, I revere Him. I walk in a way that I know what He's done. And in praise of His works and in fear of His name, I'm not going to walk like that. It's been said by so many pastors, writers, there's no skeletons in God's closet. There's nothing as you peer into God's works and His Word in particular, the full revelation of Himself that you're ever going to be like, ooh, I wish I hadn't learned that. No, the deeper you dive, the the, the more fully you examine, study Look into God's word. The more there's a, this is even better than I thought. Finally, this author says, the one who fears the Lord patiently waits for God's reward. Quotes from Psalm 147 verse 11. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. That idea of hoping in steadfast love means you're counting on it. You're relying on, oh no, God's going to come through. Listen, one who fears the Lord is not, is not bound by this momentary affliction. Or in the parlance that we use around here often, we don't mistake the moment. We don't just look at what's taking place right now and say, man, this is it? I just don't understand. I'm so discontent. I'm so disappointed. I don't know. I'm despairing. Not without addressing like the psalmist does in Psalm 42. Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why are you cast down? Hope in God. This is the testimony of the godly. Think about Job. What's his hope in in the midst of all of his suffering? One day, 
in my flesh, I'm going to see Him and praise Him. Job's hope is not what we know happens at the end of the book. Job's hope is not, hey, everything's going to pan out. God's going to answer out of a world with no big deal, guys. Let me scrape some more ooze from my wounds. No. Job's hope is right along the lines of Paul's, whether by life or by death, I want to glorify the Lord. My hope is in the future, the Lord will bring about the greatest glory. That's why Paul can write that for believers, what's going to separate us from the love of God? Shall distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Are any of those things going to, are going to finally separate us from the love of God? Not, hey, you're never going to experience those things. It's, hey, are any of those things ultimately going to matter? No. The one who fears the Lord sees beyond the moment, sees beyond the circumstance, and says, my hope is in the Lord. So whether or not we're delivered from this fiery furnace, we're still not going to bow down. So I, I can't I can't dishonor him. So how can I dishonor my God by being unfaithful in this way, Joseph says. So I'm going to forfeit all of the pleasures of Egypt, says Moses, for the joy that's in Christ. So we can take up our cross daily and follow him. Please don't forget that command from our Lord. That command from our Lord. That's implying no deaths at the end of this. The one who took up the cross and followed outside the city bearing the reproach of Christ, they weren't expecting to walk back in. Instead, their hope was in rising again. I, you know, how, how, how can I even look at life that way? How can, how can I, how can I view the circumstances that way? Do you have a big God? Is he bigger than your circumstances? Is he bigger than your problems? If he is, I guarantee you'll fear him. How can, I, how can I get that big view of God? Take heed to his word. And that's going to look like, I need wisdom then. Turn with me Proverbs chapter 4. We'll close with this. In the coming weeks, we're, we're going to consider some of the themes and some of the topics that are brought forward through the book of Proverbs in ways in which we are able to do exactly what this says. But understand, it begins with the fear of the Lord. It begins with, we know Him from His Word, we see Him as He is, and we live accordingly. And as a result, we'll be obedient to these commands. This is an exhortation, like so much of chapters 1 through 9 is. It's an exhortation from a father to a son, from an instructor to, a teach, from a, from an instructor to their student. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 4, Hear, O sons, the instruction of a father. Give attention that you may gain understanding, for I give you sound teaching. Do not abandon my instruction. When I was the son to my father, tender and the only son in the sight of my mother, then he taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast to my words. Keep my commandments and live. All right, what is, what is the commandment? What is this thing that's so important? It's not the law, not, not right here. This is a specific commandment that the father is exhorting the son, or the teacher is exhorting the student. Verse 5, acquire wisdom. Acquire understanding. Do not forget, nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will guard you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. With all your acquiring, get understanding. What do we want to leave with this evening? This exhortation, this command. Get wisdom. And with all you're getting, get understanding. 
Beloved, where are we going to get it? By taking heed to his word. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you are gracious. Lord, you are kind. Your loving kindness is everlasting. Lord, you have displayed it in your word and the kindness of providing a guide to wisdom that we would walk among the wise. Lord, you have given wisdom fully and finally in your Son. Lord, you've commanded us to walk after him. May we as your redeemed walk in a way of understanding so we'd be pleasing to you. We ask these things in the name of your Son. Amen.